Left in. Why you sky is sloppy? Are you okay? How do you do? Good day. Thank you. Mr. Minister, uh, our ambassador, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, thank you very much for having me back here in Latvia. I have been here several times before, and Latvia has a very special place in my, my heart, and it's very nice to see some old colleagues, old friends here in the audience. Um, how many of you are teachers here this morning? Okay. I want to thank you, all teachers here, for your service. Um, I know quite a bit about the teaching and schools here in Latvia, and I can, I can truly tell you how much I appreciate the work that you have been doing over the years, over the difficult times, and I, I think nobody here in this room should seriously think, uh, regardless of the numbers that you saw from the minister's presentation, that you have a bad or lousy education system or that you have bad teachers or poor principals. I think this is not the situation. As the evidence shows, I think Latvia is actually doing quite well internationally. And what is uh, encouraging to hear from, um, from Mr. Minister's presentation is that you, you are still free from many of those crazy ideas that are traveling around the world in education reforms. I will talk a little bit more about this, but I, I think the, the skill he, here really and everywhere else is to get the policies right, to get the system really um, operate as a system, as a complex system. Uh, and if we know any, anything at all about making education systems perform, well, one of, one of, one of the things is that we we are not likely to be successful if we only try to reform education system by changing one or two or three elements and parts of education. We have to see it as a system, and this is, the, this is my, one of my lessons here this morning. Okay? I want to give you one minute because of this uh, very comprehensive and rich presentation. Just one minute to think some of these questions. What, what do you think is important in education? Just take one, one minute. I, I need to drink something, so. <laughs> but you think, don't talk. Just think, of what, what do you think is really important in education in general? Okay. Aldis, okay, keep, keep these ideas with you and let's go and see a little bit what, what Finland has to tell us here this morning. A couple of remarks before I start. First, I, I didn't come here to, to Riga this morning to tell you that Finland has the best education system in the world. I think we have been able to create something that is good and is good enough and we have also been able to create education system that most Finnish parents and taxpayers are very happy with. And I, I think that's alone uh, enough to tell the story. Okay? I didn't come here either this morning to tell you that if Latvians, if you only do what the Finns did, you will be fine. Yeah? Don't think like this because you cannot you can rarely borrow anything or take, deliver any part of Finnish education system here and say that now we have done it like the French did it. Yeah? I went to France to the Prime Minister's office a couple of years ago and they said that, they told me that we have fixed the French education system because we took three elements from your primary education system in Finland. And it simply doesn't work like this. I think the, 
the reason why I'm, I'm here is to encourage each of us to learn from one another. And my book, Finnish Lesson, is, is equally a book about what Finland could learn about Finnish uh, experience and experience from others. So I think that learning from one another is the thing we should be doing, not importing or stealing or borrowing ideas, because they really, really work. Finnish story is not about uh, transferring ideas from other countries. Actually, we have borrowed many ideas from Sweden, and you know the, the relationship between Finland and Sweden is like uh, Latvia and Estonia. Yeah? That's why it's, a, it's a quite difficult to be in a, in a Stockholm School of Economics building as a Finn here. <laughs> And I'm, I'm proud to be, I'm, I'm one of those who is proud to be a neighbor of Sweden because part of my family is there and uh, my family is a Swedish speaking, Finnish family as well, so there's no problem with that, okay? So let's start, let's go with this and um, uh, my first question really is that why Finland in, in this context when we talk about education performance because just uh, 10 years ago there was nothing really to share with anybody about Finnish education. Yeah? When I was working here in, with the Latvian teachers and schools in 1990s and just around uh, 2000, 2001, it was right before the first OECD PISA results came out. Nobody really asked me or anybody from Finland about these educational achievements. Yeah? So it's a fairly new thing and now the question is why Finland? I don't know what goes, what moves in your mind if you, when, when you see this magic word Finland or you say Suomi, yeah? When you think about Suomi, yeah? What do you think? What's in your mind? Happy children, what else? Nokia, cold. Huh? Okay, you know, this, when I travel in Australia, United States or Africa or China, and I ask the same question, what do you think when you hear the word Finland? And it's, a, it's interesting because all the images are the same. You know, this is the most common idea that people associate with when they think about my country. Snow and dark and ice and cold. Yeah? And it's interesting because for many people it's difficult to understand how you can have all these accomplishments, like good education system, when you have conditions like this, okay? <laughs> and many people, by the way, they think that conditions are always like this in Finland. <laughs> I was living in Italy for three years, and when I was coming back home, I got a delegation of my Italian friends with the flowers and cakes and wine coming to me and say that, they say that we are so sorry that you have to go back home. <laughs> and I said, why is this? And they say that because we understand that it's always ice and cold and dark in Finland. Yeah? <coughs> In the United States the other day, there was somebody came to me and said that now I understand why Finland is so, so good in PISA and these international studies. And it's because the conditions are like this. Yeah? <laughs> Children cannot go, they cannot go out. They stay indoors and do homework all the time. Yeah? <laughs> There's nothing else to do but do homework. Yeah? So it's, it's quite difficult to understand these things. This is the other one that is quite often people think that this is Finland. Yeah? <laughs> That we are forest people, yeah? And like this guy here, I, d I don't know if he's tired or under some other types of uh, substances. <laughs> but there's something in this picture that really reminds me of Finland. Because Finnish people, maybe this is true with Latvians uh, also, but Finnish people in, in one way are very different than Americans or British or Italians. And it is that we find peace in solitude that we want to be by ourselves. That's why we have the lakes and saunas and all these things where we want to go alone with anybody and, and not to talk too, too much. When I moved to the United States, one of the most difficult things for me was to find, uh, learn how to com talk when you have nothing to say. <laughs> yeah? Do you know this feeling that you have to talk to somebody and think that what should I say next because there's nothing, nothing to tell. Yeah? <laughs> But in two years, I became very good in this. So I can talk two hours without saying too much. <laughs> this is the, the thing called small talk. Yeah? And let me tell you a little story about the, the two Finns. They were really uh, best friends. And they met after many years. 
by accident in Helsinki, and they were so, they were so delighted about this uh, reunion that they decided to go to the nearby restaurant and just celebrate, take a couple of drinks because they were so happy that they finally met one another in the city. So they went into the bar and ordered two glasses of vodka. They had the vodkas, but didn't say anything. Okay? Then they ordered two more, had the vodkas, still no words. Third vodkas came, there was still silence. Okay? And then when they were having their fourth vodkas, the other fellow said that, kippis. And you know what kippis is? Yeah, it's like cheers. How do you say in Latvian? Yeah. Ah, okay. So he, he raised his glass and said that Kippis, I was really funny, really happy about this, uh, finding this guy. And his friend said that, did we come here to drink or to talk? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Ice hockey, a sport, is something that many people think about, uh, our Formula One drivers or hockey players or skiers or ski jumpers. So sport is a very important, uh, just like uh, music and arts uh, in Finland. And then, of course, Santa Claus, yeah? Some people say that Santa Claus is a Swedish man, but believe me, he's not. He's living, <laughs> he's living in the northern part of Finland. When I travel in Asia, in Japan and China, everybody knows, first thing they say is Santa Claus is from Finland, and that's a nice, uh, of course, a good... It's one of these Finnish brands, right, that we are known of. But, you know, all these, all these images, and there are many more that people uh, think about, are not really very close to what could explain good education, right? These are all like a, um, uh, like a fairy tale, something that is difficult to really understand what's going on. Finland is a very strange place. We, are, we like to do things in a, in a different way than many others, especially Swedes. <laughs> okay? okay, let's be a little bit more serious and see how, how, how can we... Uh, how can we, what, what should we think about when we are trying to understand, make sense about the Finnish education? And please do remember that I'm not saying that Finland has the best education system in, in the world because this is not necessarily true, because we are often only looking at this OECD PISA studies, and that's only a very small little part of the, uh, the play. So here in Latvia, I, I think you should never think that the OECD PISA is there ultimate final evidence of a good education system. It's an important part of it, but there are many other things that we should be looking at, and some of them are even more important. Three things I think that are very important here is that, that Finland has not always been a good high performer. In my book, uh, I collected, uh, when I did the research for the book, I collected every, all the evidence that we have in Finland internationally related to our, our international performance against um, other countries. And all the evidence I have, whether I take the enrollment rates or graduation rates, uh, achievement, uh, student assessments, funding, anything, uh, shows that Finland has been at best on, uh, uh, at the average of international performance. So we, we, have, we have not always been uh, praised as a good education system. Probably more importantly, Finland has never wanted to be number one. And this is, maybe this is clear and obvious to you, but there are many people who believe, who think that maybe Finnish education policies and reforms were decided, uh, designed in, in the early days to take Finland to the top of the world. And this is completely wrong. We never had these policies, we have never had reforms that would have aimed to make Finland the best country in the world. Yeah? I will tell you a little while what has been the key ideas in our education reforms and policies since 1970s. And they are very different to, to this. Yesterday when I, uh, I was privileged to uh, address your uh, president, and I told this uh, story about Sweden, and I want to share it with you again, because it's a, it's a true story, and it's a quite funny one, I think, um, related to this particular fact. And now when we are in the Stockholm School of Economics building, I think it's a very appropriate to, to share this story with you. In some way in 1990s, I was working in the Ministry of Education in Finland. This was about five years before the o first OECD PISA was conducted. And you know, the OECD PISA was a very important thing for many countries who <coughs> thought that their education system is the best in the world, including Sweden and Norway and Germany, England, France, United States, many countries, they thought that they will be on the top of the OEC, first OECD PISA study. Okay? So we were in Sweden, in Stockholm, and had a meeting with the mi then Minister of Education, with our minister, uh, and we were sitting in the cabinet and hearing, listening to the Swedish minister telling us how the Swedish 
education reform will eventually take Sweden to, the, to be the best education system in the world by year 2000. And then our minister had a chance to reply, so of course she said that thank you very much, Mr. Minister, it's all very interesting and I can, I only be, wish you all the best and good luck with your, your efforts to make what you want to do, but I can only tell you that in Finland our goals in our education are much more modest than yours. Because you see, in Finland, for us, it's enough to be ahead of Sweden. Yeah? And the, the interesting thing was that this actually happened, yeah? Okay. And then the third one, uh, equally important thing, I think that everybody has to keep in mind who wants to understand what is going on in Finnish education and why everybody's talking about this. You know, Finland is a good country in many other ways as well. So it's not just education that is performing well, but the country as a whole is a, is a well-performing um, system. Yeah? We have a very good governance in Finland. If you look at the Transparency International Studies, Finland is always there in the, among the top countries with the least incidences of likelihood of corruption in the country. We have one of the most competitive economies, national economies in the world. We have a very advanced technology in the society. We have a very uh, uh, widespread gender equity, um, equal rights for everybody. We have a sustainable development policies that are on the top of the world and many other things. That's why many, many um, comparisons and rankings, like for example the International Prosperity Ranking in England, uh, continuously ranks Finland as the most prosperous nation in the world. The Newsweek about 18 months ago ranked Finland as the best country in the world. Um, by the way, there's an interesting, uh, I, I'm sure that our ambassador knows this story, but when the Newsweek cover story 18 months ago was published, um, I don't know if you saw that. It, was, it said that, and the best country in the world is, and then you had to read the story, and the country is Finland, right? Suomia, okay? So, and th this was, of course, a huge surprise for the Finns as well, just like the first Pisa. The same morning when this, when this uh, Newsweek story was published, where the story was that Finland is the best country in the world, there were two phone calls to the Newsweek headquarters asking for recounts saying that there's a mistake there. And, and the reason to, th to believe that there's a mistake in the, in the mathematical calculation was that all the indexes, all the six indexes in that story has a maximum of 100 points. And one of the indexes is education. And Finnish score in education was 102. So this is how good the Newsweek thinks Finnish education system is. So these two phone calls were saying that, you know, you have a mistake, you have to calculate, and it's actually Switzerland that is the best country in the world, not Finland. Do you know where these phone calls came from? <laughs> Can you guess? Sweden? <laughs> Switzerland? Both wrong. They both came from Helsinki. Yeah? From our two newspapers, and they simply didn't believe that Finland is the best country in the world. So there was a six-hour confusion in Newsweek when they were trying to see what's going on there, and then the Newsweek uh, released the press uh, release saying that Finland is the best country in the world, full stop. The next day, our biggest newspaper had an editorial saying that everybody thinks that Finland is the best country in the world except the Finns. <laughs> and this is very true in our education as well, that there are many people outside of Finland who think that we have the best education system in the world, but very few people in Finland who believe that this is the case. And the simple reason is that, you know, for Finnish teachers and principals and many people, it really doesn't, doesn't matter. What matters is that we have good schools for everybody and that parents and the country is proud of what we are able to offer through our public school system, okay? So this is how it looks like and I think this is very important when we talk about Finland to make sure that we, we have the evidence and that we, we understand that there has been a progress starting from 1970s. So this was how the situation looked like in 70s and still 80s, that Finland, our country, was running behind the world. Yeah? So if, if you take any education indicators, Finland was below the world average. Okay? And then something, something has happened that looks like this. Okay? The world international progress in education has been relatively weak. You know, many countries say that they have many folded their funding in education, but the results are not uh, satisfactory. Okay? There are some countries where they say that the uh, the, the level of education, the quality of education has declined during the, 
the last few decades. Okay? In any way, Finland has been able to pass the, the many other countries and this is a, no, it doesn't work. Anyway, if you look at the 1990s, between 1990s and 2000, that's the time when Finland went through a very serious economic crisis. Uh, our GDP declined 8, 9% and unemployment went to 20% 20, 20 and so on. In normal circumstances, in almost any other country, we would have been seeing the decline also in education. Yeah? But in Finland, we didn't let it happen because we continued investing in education, particularly in research and innovation work. And this was very much also because of the Nokia. You know, you remember Nokia started to focus on mobile communication technologies in, in the end of 1980s and 1990s. So it was important to keep this engine going. So we, uh, rather than we cut education and research funding, we increased it. We kept it increasing so that the country can recover, and that's why we were so rapidly coming back from the crisis. Yeah? So I was invited to speak in Ireland last year when um, Irish people are in a very difficult situation economically, and this was my message to the Irish um, politicians, is that don't cut funding for education, because it will be very difficult to come back when the times are better. It takes a skill and consensus to decide what to do. But this is, this is how Finland has been able to pass. And now, if we look at the situation today, we seem to be doing quite uh, well compared to many others. So, now the question is that what did we do? Of course, if there has been this steady progress and improvement in Finland over the last 30 or 40 years, the good question is that how did it happen, right? Okay, so we have basically two alternatives. Again, I think very important. The first, op first option is that we have had similar, same policies or similar policies than everybody else, but we have just been better in implementation. We have had more resources or we have a, have a kind of a smarter way of I implementing this or some other things. But the point here is that, the question here is that did Finland have similar policies than everybody else, like America and England and Sweden, uh, other countries? and just, we were just uh, luckier with the implementation. Or, did we perhaps have a different policies and very different implementation of these reforms? And ladies and gentlemen, this is something that we have to answer these questions first before we can really understand anything at all why Finland has been so successful. Okay? And my, my argument this morning is that Finland is where it is today in education, in global education, because we have been brave enough to choose very different policies and with a very different way of implementing than most other countries. So we have not been following this global movement that I will, I will tell you briefly in the end of my presentation that unfortunately many other countries have done, like Sweden for example, and, and uh, other, our Nordic neighbors, they have, uh, I, I would say that they the, the, the difference there is that they have followed too much what's going on in the world without thinking whether it's good for the country's uh, education systems. So I'll offer you three things uh, this morning to, to think about in what Finland has been particularly uh, addressing in its ed education reforms that I think are very important in uh, both understanding why we are where we are and also considering whether some parts of these ideas could be part of the Latvian uh, education thinking for the, uh, for the future. And one of them is that we have, we have always placed equity before quality in our education reform. Let me repeat this because this is important. The Finnish education reforms since the 1970s have always been addressing equity and equality of educational opportunity as a primary uh, driver and element of our education policy and reform. Meaning that equity means here that we do not allow the student's family background to determine their educational performance. Yeah? Because everybody knows that children's family background, their social, uh, economic and cultural factors of their family is the strongest determinant of anybody's success in the school. We understood this in Finland very well already in 1970s. 
And that's why we have to address these things first to make sure that the, these cultural, economic and social uh, factors of our pupils will not drive or determine their educational success. It's a very important point and only then we were talking about high quality uh, achievement. Okay? Are you with me? Yeah, it's, it's a very important uh, issue. I was not teaching then, and I, I was not even education then, but I remember when I started to work, when I went to teacher education in Finland, and my first year in teaching in the, in the middle of 1980s, we still were debating in Finland whether this idea is going to be good for the country or not. There were many people who believed that this idea of basic school, or your, is it Pamat, Pamat school? This nine-year um, uh, comprehensive school where everybody goes to the same school. We are not allowing any private schools to uh, operate in Finland. That we insist that all the children go to the same school with the same curriculum, similar cur curriculum and so on. That eventually this is going to ruin the country. It's going to take the level of knowledge and skills in Finland down to the drain. And only because of this equity principle. So it, this was not really an idea that we Anybody, anybody knew whether it's going to work, but we believed in this thing, and that's why we kept on working. And there was, but there was a lot, lot of there was a harsh criticism in the, within the society against this idea that the equi uh, putting equity first in the education policy will be uh, will bring Finland to the disaster. Okay, and it was only until the December 4th, 2001, when the first OECD study was published, when we had international evidence that Finland was not only performing high in all areas of literacy, mathematics and science, but we also had the most equitable system of education in the world, that this policy really worked. And as I will tell you in the end of my presentation, this is what the OECD is now concluding for all its member states. That, you, that we can combine the equity and quality uh, at the same time, okay? So some of the key policies, what, what does it mean in practice? What, what did Finland do and what could anybody who is interested in this type of policy to do uh, consider? I think the first thing really is to, like the minister was talking about, the funding of education, uh, public education here in, uh, in Latvia. We have to have a funding system, the funding mechanism of education that is fair, and not only fair, but that is providing resources for those who are in the most need, whether it's an individual child or teacher or the school or the municipality. And this is what Finland has been continuously and systematically doing in our system. We, we, we know this Finland as a positive discrimination and this positive discrimination means that we are providing more f financial and other resources to those who have more needs. For example, the schools that are operating in the areas where there are more immigration, unemployed or social, uh, low social class uh, um, families, uh, single parent families and so on, they will get more resources to be able to cope with these things. Municipalities and schools where children have to travel long distances to come to school will have more resources because they are working in the more complicated situations. I think it's a very important to have a smart and good funding system. I came from Australia on Monday and Australia at the moment is in a huge dispute over how the country's education system should be financed. And they are only now realizing how important it is to finance education fairly and provide resources to those who are really in need. We have public education systems today as we speak who are doing exactly the opposite, where the schools and teachers and communities that are doing well in education, when they can show good results, will receive rewards and more money to operate. It's a completely opposite policy than Finland has been doing. Secondly, I think we have very, very early on in 1970s already uh, put in place the policies that are based on early intervention and support. You know, the educational success in Finland actually starts when the baby is still the mother's womb. Because we want to make sure that all the children before they're born and, and during their first uh, six or seven years of uh, childhood, that they will be taken care of. And also that we are, we are checking the development of, of each and every child 
before they come to school several times so that we know if there's something that needs to be supported or helped, they will receive um, uh, that help before. So it's, it's a very important part of the Finnish equity policies. Then in our elementary school, when, when I say elementary school, it's a grades one, two, three or four, uh, well-being is the first priority in every school. It's not learning, it's not learn to read or write or mathematics, it's a well-being of every child is the most important thing. Because we understand that only when ch children are happy and feel good, they are able to learn. That's why we are providing health care, dental care, uh, healthy school lunch and many other support services for free for everybody every day. And we have done that already for the last uh, for 40 years. And then we have an inclusive special education policy that is uh, unlike anything else in, the, in this world. Because we have more, more young Finnish people in special education, as we understand it, than any other country uh, in Europe. About one third of our, our basic school, Bamat school pupils, are in special education as we speak. One third. And half of those who graduate, who leave the, uh, the basic school, have been in, in some type of special uh, education or support during their school life. Okay? So this is how the, the picture should, uh, should look like, or, or will look like if we, look, if we combine the, the, the learning and equity. Okay? The outcomes and the, and the equity. This is a, the picture from the OECD PISA, where you can see the countries, the further the country is on the right, the better the, the PISA score in literacy is, and the higher the country is uh, in this picture, the more equitable the e education system is. Okay? So all those countries that are there in, the, in this blue uh, area, Finland, Korea, Canada, are the ones who have been able to combine equity with equality. So Latvia is over there, and I think your challenge, uh, your roadmap to uh, excellence um, should include these both elements, right? It's not enough to think about how do we improve the test scores of students in international studies or even in your national assessments. Equally important thing is that how do you improve and enhance the equity of the system, make sure that everybody can, uh, can learn. My interpretation to the question that was asked here about why, why the performance of the higher part of the, the student population has been decreasing um, and the middle part has been improving is that your system is probably putting too much emphasis on the average students. And it's a common thing in many countries that teachers are teaching, and schools are teaching just the average group. They ignore the, the lower achievers and they don't pay attention to the high achievers. And that's what happens, that's what you see. So it also probably shows that your system is not able to personalize or individualize uh, the learning of students as it could be, okay? So this is another thing, this is about the, the students, uh, the variation of students' uh, literacy scores. You know, Latvia is not doing bad at all. If you take the OECD PISA study, Latvia is there with a relatively small variation between um, good and, and poor students. The interesting thing is here when we look at what part of this variation is coming from between school differences, okay? And this is how it looks like in OECD, Finland and Latvia. And we, Latvia and Finland, are very similar, meaning that the differences between our schools are fairly small. Here, your different, between school differences in reading literacy in Latvia is about one third or one fourth of the OECD average. So it's a very good, it's a good situation. It's easier to improve from here than from any other circumstances. Let me show a couple of, you a couple of pictures about the, the smart resource or time management that you were talking about. Um, in, uh, based on the, the minister's uh, presentation. In Finland, we have less teaching time on our teachers than many other countries uh, in the world. So Finnish teachers are teaching relatively um, shorter school days than anybody, almost anybody else, else in the world. So he, here you can see that this is from the OECD da database again, different countries. Latvia is not there because you are not in the OECD. You are not the member of the OECD. So, but just if you look at the United States and then Finland, this is the annual teaching load in different countries. Just to give you an idea how differently teachers are, are working in diff different parts of the world, the difference between the American and Finnish teachers in terms of one day of work is that in, in the United States and many other countries, teachers are teaching, spending two hours, 120 minutes, 
more every day in a classroom than in Finland. And this, of course, is important if we want our teachers to collaborate, if we want them to talk about their school improvement, they, they um, work on their, their own school curriculum, or do, do anything else as professionals. It's very difficult to, to create a teaching profession that is really professional if teachers are only teaching day in and day out. It, it doesn't happen like this. I often say that, show me the medical doctor or, or somebody who is doing surgeries, who is doing an open heart surgery eight hours a day, every day, one after another. Or show me the lawyer who is spending eight hours a day in a courthouse, case after another. They never work like this. Doctors, they meet with other doctors and they think about what they do and then they do the good job. Yeah? Lawyers do exactly the same thing. Architects, designers, engineers, everybody's doing the same. So should teachers. And this is a very important part of making teaching a profession, is that we include this working with other professionals as part of the package. We also have uh, less teaching time uh, or learning time for students, and this was something that came through your questions. The interesting thing is that Finland seems to have a very low, low amount of classroom hours for, that we require our pupils and students to sit in. Again, this is from the OECD data. Latvia is not there because you are not part of the OECD. But you can see that in Finland, between ages 7 and 14, so we are looking at eight years of schooling, of, of uh, Pamat school. Okay? The Finnish students have much less uh, time in the classroom uh, than many others. Compared to the Netherlands or Australia, this means two years of formal schooling, two years more in favor of the Dutch. Yeah? And in the Netherlands, children go to school and they're five, or sometimes four, so they get another two years in favor of the Dutch uh, people. So a 15-year Dutch has four or five years more formal schooling behind him or her compared to the Finnish uh, students. Huge difference, yeah? So this would indicate that the time is not really the solution. Having more time or less time in a classroom or school is not likely to make the difference as we want to. Yeah, because if it would, we, would ha we should see much more clear a correlation here that if you have more classroom time, you should have more better results. But you don't really see this. Yeah? So it's a better question is that how should we spend this time? What should we do when we are in a school? What type of curriculum or teaching method, methods we should have to make the most out of this time that we have? So this is something that I got from the... If you look at the Eurydice, uh, it's interesting because it's shows that Latvia actually has a very small number of compulsory classroom hours for the grades 1 to 9 children. Yeah? I was surprised to see this uh, in the EU, the European Union statistics, that anybody of you, if you want to go there, you can find exactly this data. It's about 5,000 hours a year. Yeah? 5,000 hours combined. So it's even less than Finland. Yeah? And now, again, if we take the OECD PISA results here, you will see that there's no correlation. So it doesn't mean that the more countries have instruction hours for pupils, the better the results. It doesn't really correlate at all. So this is um, something that we should uh, rethink. Less homework. We heard about the homework, uh, amount of homework. In, f in Finland, people, young people do um, very little homework. In, in our elementary school, there's in many schools that the policy is to do all the homework at home, okay? And then finally, I want to mention a few things about the teacher professionalism, which is a very important, this is my third message here this morning, and um, it's a kind of a cornerstone of the Finnish success, that we have uh, deliberately and systematically upgraded our teaching profession since the 1970s to be a high profession uh, among lawyers and doctors, uh, and this is how it works. This is my niece, Vera, she's 26 years old now, and she's graduating to be a primary school teacher this, this spring. Okay? And her picture is here because she called me about six years ago and said that I, I have decided to become a primary school teacher. And she was graduating from the gymnasium or secondary school with the highest marks on any, everything, all the subjects. She was a straight A student. Yeah? And she said to me that, what should I do? How can I get in? And I said, you're a smart girl and you're doing figure skating and music and all these things that needs to be done if you want to become a teacher in Finland. Just go there and you will do it. 
three months later, she called me crying, saying that, Uncle, they didn't take me. And I said, tell me what's, what happened. And she was so sad about this thing that she could hardly speak. And she said that, you know, I went all the way, everything went well, all the way until the panel interview. You know, all, all the candidates are interviewed by the professors and lect lecturers in our universities to check that these people are, uh, really want to be teachers. And one of the questions that they were asking, she said, was that, Vera, why do you want to teach? Why do you want to become a teacher? Because with your uh, diploma, school diploma, you could go to law or medicine or business or anything you want, but why do you want to teach? And she said that, you know, my mother is a teacher and my uncle is a teacher and my grandfather was a school teacher all his life, so I want to teach. And for this panel, it was not enough. They asked if she has anything to add, and Vera said, no, education is a family business, you see. <laughs> they didn't tell her then, but afterwards I, I contacted some of my colleagues who were making these interviews, and they simply said that she was not able to convince them that she is a teacher, that she, this is what she wants to do. And so I said to her that go back to school for a year, work as a teaching assistant, and see how it feels. You know, if you still feel that this is what you want to do, go back and they will take you. This is what she did. And to this question of why do you want to teach, she was able to talk on, uh, from, from her experience. What she saw in a school, how she felt working with the children and, and teachers, and now she's very happy uh, graduate of uh, one of the Finnish primary school teachers. You know, we have thousands of people like Vera every year. This is the situation in her university and mine last year, last summer. We got 2,400 applicants to primary school teacher education program that is a ma master's based research degree in Finland. Very demanding and, and difficult to do. 2,400, 2,400 applicants, and we accepted 120. So it means that there's a very tough competition to get in. One of the candidates that was successful was there for the seventh time. So this is how much this young woman wanted to be a teacher. Yeah? And you can imagine that those who are lucky enough to get in, they study hard, they make their way through the, all the way to degree, and unlike we heard here in Latvia where out of 1,000 students, only seven go to school in Finland. Out of these 700 graduates every year, or 650, 640 will go to teach, all of them, because they know that this is their, their work. It's a very competitive, uh, competitive thing. In Finland, we believe that to, to be good in anything, you need to have 10,000 hours of practice. Yeah? 10,000 hours of practice means 10 years of teaching or six years of being a teacher in a school, but you can never be a good teacher uh, statistically in a short period of time. Yeah? And that's why those countries where teachers are only serving for a short time, like in the United States, for example, most teachers leave before the end of the fifth year. You will never have the situation where teachers are able to learn to become good. Yeah? So that's why the key is really to try to keep these teachers teaching as long as possible and support them, provide them this professional support that somebody was asking here, and make sure that they can learn continuously all the time. And then we can expect that somewhere there in the seventh, eighth, or tenth year, we will have these good professionals there. But not before that. Yeah? So let me say a few things to the end about the global educational reform movement that, uh, that I mentioned in the uh, early part of my presentation. This is something that is a, is a kind of an orthodoxy that many countries, many policymakers, and many ministers believe that this is the way we have to uh, reform our, our national education system. There are many elements in this. I write about this uh, in detail in my book. These are some of the things that I include in this global education reform movement. And all those who are interested in acronyms, you know, this, this world is full of acronyms. If you take the acronym of the global educational reform movement, you get the word germ. Yeah? You know what a germ is? It's something that makes you really, if you get the infection, you normally feel bad and sometimes you will die. R rarely you die, but in some cases. But it can make you really feeling bad, okay? And this global educational reform movement is a kind of a policy germ that, that the consultants and international development institutions and many others uh, carry from one place to another and they infect new education systems and then they really don't work. And unless you can work out, cure the, the, the infection, you are not able to get better. 
sometimes I say, uh, with a little sense of humor, that my book, if you read my book, it will kill 99.9% .9 of all germs. <laughs> this is what the Americans like, okay? But the Finnish way, you know, we have, uh, we have tried to avoid competition between students and schools and teachers in our system. Um, we have um, instead uh, built the policies that emphasize collaboration, networking, sharing, doing things together between schools and teachers rather than competition. We don't have standardization in Finland because we believe that we want to, um, we want to have more personalized, individualized learning. In Finland, many people think that the future of Finnish economy and society that is based on the idea of creativity and innovation that Mr. Minister was mentioning will be critically depending on the education system's ability to produce diversity, not standard products. Yeah? It's very simple, right? That if, if we assume that everybody will be ed educated to the same standard, it means that everybody will know the, more or less the same things, they will think in a similar way, and we will have very few people, that like Mr. Minister was saying, that you want to see people who are able to make mistakes. Yeah? And you can only make mistakes if you, have, if you allow diversity or personalization to happen. And that's why this customization of schools in Finland and personalization of learning at the individual level is the key part of our education reform, not standardization. School choice, we have, not, uh, we, we have tried to limit the school choice in Finland to the point where the choice would be taking place within the school, not between the schools. Okay? And that's why I see that equity and school choice are the two opposite of the same continuum. So a very important part of the, the thing in Finland. And privatization. We don't have any private schools, so that's why we have systematically built the public, public school system, because we believe that education is for public uh, good. Let me show you the last, uh, last things very quickly, and then we can have conversation. So my conclusion here is that one of the outcomes of this Finnish story is that it's together with the countries like Canada and Korea and Singapore and some others, China even, it's uh, revealing the the wrong policies, the wrong drivers that countries are trying to use in, in their education reforms. I'm not talking about Latvia here, but this is a global, global story. One of them is the testing policy. In many countries we are seeing the kind of a, uh, increasing number of standardized testing of students. Yeah? Just look at England and Scandinavian countries and America, Canada, Australia, many others. The standardized testing is believed to be a kind of a uh, cure for the um, inadequate performance. It's not so. Accountability policy is the other one where teachers and principals are held accountable for students' uh, performance. Again, a policy that is important that should not be used as a driver for reform, like Americans are doing. It's simply showing all the research, all the evidence is showing that it's not going to work. And then finally, the teacher policy. I think this is another area where we should have more comprehensive policies for making teaching a prof high profession rather than finding a ways where we can uh, replace teachers and fire teachers for something else, which is another um, uh, other case where there's a lot of research evidence now showing that this is not a good policy. It may be good for some intermediate um, uh, periods, but it's not a good uh, comprehensive policy. So when I look at the world and how things are going on in education, it seems to me that there are many countries, many ministers and uh, education systems where they are trying to do the wrong thing a little bit wider. Yeah? And it doesn't make any sense. It's like uh, Einstein's definition for insanity, when Einstein said that doing the same things over and over again and expecting different results is a definition of insanity. Then you're insane when you try to do these things. Yeah? And I'll just show you the uh, Sir... Uh, Winston Churchill here. He was not a great education reformer, but he was a, he was a national leader and uh, accomplished something. And he said something like this, that you can always count on Americans to do the right thing after they have tried everything else. Yeah? <laughs> he could have been a great education reformer too, because this is, this is very, very true. You know, the right thing is coming there at some point, but they have to try um, everything else before. And I hope that we are not like, uh, like this, that we, we have to try everything, uh, because no, we know already how it works. This is what OECD is now concluding, and this, ladies and gentlemen, very, very important part. This is an important, uh, compelling message from the OECD that is so important for our education policies and national education reforms as well. Look at this. OECD is saying that school choice advocates often argue that the introduction of market mechanisms allows equal access to highly, um, high-quality schooling for all. Okay? However, 
evidence does not support these uh, perceptions, as choice and associated market mechanisms can, en can enhance segregation. And this is what is happening in many parts of the world, that there are more and more bad schools, where the good teachers have been moved to somewhere else, and good uh, students as well, and then those elite schools. And this inequity is just in in increasing in many parts of the world. More importantly, the OECD is continuing, saying that the highest performing education systems across the OECD countries are those that combine quality with equity. This is the first time, ladies and gentlemen, when the OECD is so clearly coming with this type of conclusion, just about a month ago when this report was released. So all those countries that are doing well, they combine quality with equity, okay? So the conclusion is that we need to invest more heavily in schools in disadvantaged communities, which are overwhelmingly public schools. Again, we get back to the, the funding um, uh, issue. Five lessons for you, and then I'll, uh, I'll close. My first lesson and kind of a summary of this presentation is that it's equity, not um, school choice, that should be driving the education policies and reforms. I think also here in, in Latvia and everywhere else, if we believe the evidence was going on. Second, it's personalization, not standardization, that should be in the, in the first place in our education policies. We have to understand and find our own interpretations what this personalization and customization means. It doesn't mean, mean that we give computers to everybody and children can study and do what they want to do. This is not personalization. Yeah? It's stupidity in my, my mind. Yeah? Third one is that responsibility and trust is the first thing that we should uh, install and establish in our school systems, not market-like accountability, where, where schools and teachers are held accountable for something that they, are, they have no chances to be. Okay? Then the fourth one, it's pedagogy, not technology. Yeah? And this is a, another important, interesting thing, because we are now in a situation where we have been investing billions and hundreds of millions of lats and euros and dollars in our schools and technology. And not the things that we expected to happen are happening, right? Another thing, ladies and gentlemen, is that today is the moment when, in general, we have more advanced technology at homes and in the hands of the children than we have in our schools. Yeah? And this is not going to change. Don't think that we will be in a situation where the school is a place where children, young people may have the most advanced technology. Those days are gone, far gone. It's only going to get worse. Yeah? In 2020, the schools can, there's no way that they can compete with the technology that everybody ha will have in, at their disposal uh, any day, every day. So it has to be pedagogy. And then the fifth one is that the teachers um, must be professionals. Unless we are able to work out the teacher education issue, decide how we should be preparing teachers here in Latvia and many other countries, how does the professionalism look like? when teachers are working in the school. How does it sound like? We are not likely to get too much out of these, any, any other area. So this is how important I think the teacher education and leader education as well is um, uh, for the future of our schools. Paldies. I think that a very important thing that we heard from our guest speaker, and that is something that is different, different. You do things differently, and the courage to do things differently. And it's a story about ability to learn from your mistakes. And I think the Finns have the courage to take uh, um, uh, things, uh, to look at things differently, to learn from your mistakes, to start doing things differently. And so the system in question on succession will be the same as previously. I don't hear the speaker. Mm -hmm. uh, you may put the questions into in Latvian. On this prequels. Uh, couldn't you uh, dwell a little bit more on the issue which you finished with, uh, teachers as professionals, not as generalists, so, and the professionalism of uh, headmasters of schools, what does it imply in the Finnish context? Thank you very much. Very important question. Let me, let me speak a little bit about the leader 
professionalism because I think uh, being a professional teacher is something something that I already spoke about. In Finland, I think we have the, the toughest regulation of any country to become a principal in a school and for this very same reason that we want to be absolutely sure that our school leaders are professionals. First of all, in Finland you cannot lead the school, any school, unless you are qualified to teach in that same school. So it means, it's, it's a kind of a foundation for this leader professionalism. It means that if you are leading the school in Finland, you really have to understand how that type of school operates. You have to be able to understand what's going on in a classroom. You have to be able to see the school work also from the, from the teacher's perspective. Yeah? This is not the case in many countries. I think here in Latvia you don't have this, this tough regulation that you have to be qualified to, to be a primary school teacher before you can lead the primary school. This means in Finland that high school, the secondary school principal can never lead a primary school and vice versa. You have to be qualified to um, be a teacher in the, in the same school. And then all the principals, before they can, be, before they can uh, place in the school, to lead the school, they have to go through an academic leadership training or equivalent training offered by somebody else. It's normally a one-year part-time study in our universities that includes leadership, management, uh, financial management, uh, many other areas, legislation, uh, but, and change, change management and so on. So we want to be sure that those people who are leading the schools that they understand, really understand what's happening in, in the school that they are leading. Yeah? And this, there has been a big change in, in this way since the uh, last 20 years. 20 years, even 15 years ago we still had, not 15, 20 years ago we still, it was possible to become a principal by just in the length of your service. You have been teaching for 30 years and you became a principal. It never happens today anymore. We don't have any principal who is there only because of the kind of a reward for good and long service. You really need to be a professional leader before you can get there. Tobias? Not my short time, Hans. Um, given Finland's constitutional commitment to sustainable development, to what extent has education for sustainable de development been integral to the success of education reform in Finland? I really don't know. I, 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 don't, have, I don't have anything that I could say, uh, say about this. The only thing I can say about the, the, this overall success is that I belong to those who believe that there's probably a kind of a more comprehensive way of doing things in Finland than they would be to do and make any particular area of our society work well. It's a kind of a Finnish way. If there's any, anything called Finnish way, I think it's how we, can, how we are able to solve the problems in Finland. We have a, our ambassador knows very well that we have the, we have the kind of a brand delegation work that is try, has tried to identify what is, the, what is the essence of being a Finn. And one of those things, uh, correct, is the, our, our approach kind of a constructive approach to solve the problem, problem solvers. So I often say that Finnish educators are also, we are kind of a social engineers, that we hate committees and meetings and working groups, just like Finnish engineers. You know, this is what distinguishes a Finnish engineer, a businessman, from the Swedish one. In Sweden, they love to meet, sit in the cabinets and meetings and argue and talk about things. Uh, but in, uh, in Finland, the business people hate that. You know, they want to go there and solve the problem, identify the issue and then go and make it work. This is the same thing in education and many other areas as well. Thank you. Next three questions. You, uh, after the polls, and, and yeah. uh, could you bring the microphone there? Okay, thank you uh, very much, Dr. Rosalberg, for a very interesting presentation. Uh, my name is Jonas Klarin, I'm from the Swedish Embassy, I'm the intern. It's uh, all right. <laughs> sorry thank you for sorry the, about my sense of humor. <laughs> the kind words uh, about Sweden and uh, Swedes. Um, um, my father is a teacher. He's been a public school teacher for 35 years. I think that uh, he would uh, agree with uh, very much of uh, what you've spoken about today, about uh, equality and uh, uh, equality. Uh, but my, my question is uh, about uh, competition, uh, especially in Latvia, um, where I've learned that there are very many schools, especially in uh, higher education, very many universities, and uh, 
state finance research uh, institutes. Um, do you think that there are too many? I think that this is a question is also kind of um, directed to Mr. Kielis. Uh, but do you think that there are too many uh, universities and that the competition between those universities are uh, too high? Thank you. Let me, uh, let me first apologize my, my, my sense of humor, but I, I, I really love Sweden. And <laughs> <laughs> you, you, also, you are also quite good in ice hockey. <laughs> But let, let me ask you, answer you this, and maybe Mr. Minister would like to comment on the, the situation here in Latvia. If you ask me that do we have too many universities and higher education institutions in Finland, we have about 16 uni academic universities and 26 universities of applied sciences. So we have 40 universities in a small country like Finland. My answer would be that we perhaps we have too many uh, units um, operating in a small country like this. Uh, but I, I, I don't want to um, comment on the situation here in, in, in Latvia. But I, I think the future, at least in Finland, I think we, we are faced in a, we, we are in an economic situation where all these questions have to be considered. How many, how many schools, how many universities do we really need to be competitive also? You know, higher education is more than ever before a con very competitive uh, business. And that's why our universities are in a new situation because they have to also think about this competitive aspect, They're not only serving their own, own people in their own communities. And to be competitive, I think there are many people uh, who believe that being a larger unit, bigger, uh, bigger institution, you are able to be, compete better than being a small one. But I, I don't want to um, say anything about Latvia. As Latvian, I find it interesting to see that as much as in 17th century, Swedish battles are being fought in Latvia. <laughs> <laughs> Next question. I am sorry, I don't hear what he's saying because he hasn't switched on the mic. To uh, think about the purpose of education, and I'm sure there are many answers that people came up with in this room. There are people who say it's to prepare people for the workplace, others who say it's to develop a child's personality, others who say it's to prepare them to be good citizens. What's the answer that, is there an answer, a single answer for Finland? What's your answer? I mean, how do people in Finland think about this? Yes, of course, I have answer to everything. Almost. <laughs> And just very briefly, in, my, in, the, in the last part of my book, the last chapter is called Is the Future Finnish? Okay, so it's about the, the future of Finnish education from my point of view. And I, unfortunately, I have to write only about what I think because that we, don't, we don't have that much to tell in Finland about how, what is the purpose of, how do we see the purpose of schooling in the future. But my, I'm offering the following that I'm very happy to share with all my Latvian colleagues and friends here. Uh, as something to think, think about to this question of what is the purpose of schooling? Why do we, what do we try to accomplish in our future school? And I, I think the, the seed of this thinking is that, as I see it, is that the school should be a place now and in the future for sure, where the school's task would be to help everybody, all children, to find their own talents, discover who they are and what is really the thing that they will do passionately. And I'm saying this because I'm seeing in Finland and actually everywhere in the world, more and more young people who leave the school and they say that I'm not good in anything. I know many things, but there's nothing that I could feel that I am good in doing. Yeah? And even, even worse, there are more people who say that I'm not interested in anything. And we have, we have barely 6 million people in Finland. We have about 55,000 young people coming to school every year. And we need all of those. If we want to have a creative, innovative, competitive nation, we need to have everybody and more people who will say that I know who I am, I know what I can do, whether it's music or sport or whatever, whatever it is. But we need more people who will say that this is my passion. This is, this is where my element is like uh, Sir Ken Robinson is saying. So that's why my proposal is that the, the purpose of the school should be to help everybody to discover who they are 
and what is their own talent, their own area of creativity and, and where, they, where they can draw their energy from. If we are not doing this, I think the knowledge and skills that we are talking about, the 21st century skills or whatever they are, will not really mean too much. Paldies. Man nākamie divi jautājumi – Daina, Valdis un tad jums. Un tad vēl divi jautājumi pēc tam, un tad mēs beigsim. Two more questions. Uh, Sanda Kazaka, I will speak as a mother of two children. Uh, thank you very much for this very interesting insight uh, how to improve educational system. Um, and I can tell you that we are a nation that has stepped into probably a new type of vis vision or look out at the world. And now we are in the globalized world or in the process of globalization in the context of EU in order to uh, retain excellent pedagogy, we have to show excellent results or examples. What do you think? How much time Latvia is uh, needs in order to reach this kind of quality in Latvia? I, as a mother of two children, would like to invite the discussion to take the following direction. You said that you do not uh, want segregation, you do not want or approve of private schools, but but I, as a mother, want to have the best education for my children. And according to my personal experience, I have got a very poor experience in kindergarten and very poor, I don't want to have as poor experience for my children in school. Probably in the transitional stage, Latvia could have also some private schools which are um, good quality schools and only gradually those public schools or comprehensive schools should take this over. But probably private schools should be like pearls, like jewels or gems in educational system. What could be your comment upon this? Well, another important question. I think, I think that you, unfortunately, you probably have to start to think about your grandchildren's education if, um, if the question is that when the system will be performing as a system um, as you want, want it to be. I think the challenge here is that we you know, if we think about education through our own children's education, then the solutions are very different. And I, I very well understand that if, if you want to have good education for your children, you think about private school. You think about one school where the education is provided in a way that you want to do. The other way of, that the minister is probably thinking, that he's thinking about the whole country. And not only the whole country next year or after three years, but he's probably thinking also about good education for all the Latvians in the future. Okay, and, and this is a question that many people often ask, how long do we need? And unfortunately, your minister will not be around when all these um, results of the reform that we, you are putting in place today will be sought. Finnish, ex Finnish, experience, Finnish experience probably proposes that we, you know, we need, to, we need to have a longer perspective. And we need to accept that it will take probably 10 to 15 years to make the significant changes so that they will be visible and measurable in, in your school system. If you want to have a better equity, or if you want to change the teacher education dramatically, you need at least 10 years before you can expect something. So the skill is, that: are you able to come up with this type of idea that is a longer term plan, and then get everybody committed to work on this, and accept that, you know, Next year, my children probably still cannot have the kind of education that I would like to have in this system. But your grandchildren will. And the same, your children will have exactly the same question as you do now today in 20 years or 25 years, unless we do something, start to do something now. They will ask the same thing here in the same hall. Yeah? So that's why I think it's a, we have to balance these individual needs and aspirations and then the kind of a common good thinking that is on the top of the minister's agenda, of course, when, when he and, and the government is working for education for the whole country. But that's the complexity of education. Yeah? Valdis? Valdi, um, I'm Valdis Liepinch, Member of Parliament. Um, I'm convinced that Mr. Keelis has decided to hang on until his reforms are completed. <laughs> um, 
My, my question is, um, could you expand please on <clears throat> this concept of teacher accountability? What is it exactly and how do you achieve it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually, my, in my presentation, I was, uh, I'm a little bit critical or skeptical to the whole concept of teacher accountability. Because as it, it's understood now in many countries is that the system is holding uh, teachers, an increasingly individual teacher, accountable for the students' educational performance and primarily through the standardized test results. If you just, just look at, United States is a good example on this that the teachers work, they, they, their future and career depends on the students' test scores, okay? Previously, we have also situations where schools are held accountable for the students' outcomes, again, using the standardized uh, testing. And what's happening in many places, the, the reason why I find this complicated is that as soon as we start to hold individuals accountable, let's say that I'm a teacher in this school and I'm he held accountable through my students' pupils' standardized test results, the first thing that will happen is that I don't care anybody else but my students, right? And this is what American te teachers tell me very clearly. They say that I don't care what happens in my neighbor's classroom or in my school, the only thing that matters is my own class, okay? The second thing that happens is that if I have an idea as a teacher, I will not share it with other teachers because, you know, I don't care. Yeah? And, and that's, exact, that's the opposite of, that we have been trying to do in, uh, in Finnish system, where we believe that having an education system that is able to share and distribute good ideas is the one that is able to perform well. And that's why Finland is here, because we were able to move away from this com competitive competition culture to sharing and networking culture in the 19, um, 1990s. My definition for accountability is that Accountability, in particular in education, accountability is something that is left when responsibility is subtracted. Yeah? Let me repeat it once again. Accountability is something that is left when we take the responsibility away. Okay? And that's something that is not really driving, turning around education systems. It's important there, but we cannot drive education reforms by this accountability as a main driver. We have two more questions and then we finish our discussion. Thank you very much for your constructive view, for inspiring view. My name is Ivars Gribus. I have four children. Everybody mentioned the number of their children, but still, still my children will graduate school very soon, so I will not be able to enjoy the changes in the education system as a parent, but I have 20 years of experience of publishing textbooks and writing textbooks. If you have to decide or give an advice for Latvia on which education level you would need you would see the first reforms and the most investment, whether it is in the primary school, in the general education, in the lifelong learning, or where the first reforms should be taken. This depends on what type of reforms we are thinking about. If you want to have quick results in some area, then people normally address the upper secondary school. You can change many things quickly there. But if we, want to, if we are thinking about the sustainable turnaround of the education culture here, then I think you need to start to think about early childhood development, what happens before children come to school. And you, you know, one thing that people often get wrong is that they are thinking that how do we make our children ready for school? The school readiness discourse is a very common around the world. And in Finland, we have turned this around we are asking schools to be ready for children. Yeah? You have four children, right? Yes, four. Okay, let me bet. All of them are very different, right? Yes, all of them are very different. They are not the same four children. And this goes through everybody. If you have more than two, two children or more, think about it. They, children are normally in the same family. They are very different. So one of the things we need to make sure that is that our schools are ready for these very different children before they start schooling. But the systemic reform of education doesn't mean that you, you, 
you, you only focus on one part of the element or one part of the entire system. You have to look at the whole system and work in different fronts at the same time. But if you want to fix something, if you want to start from somewhere that will have a long-lasting, sustainable results and outcomes, then normally people say that we have to rethink and really give a critical look to our preschool and early childhood and development system before we can expect a sustainable result. So that would be my recommendation. And if there is not enough complexity, I would add that we as parents changed as well. Your question, and that's the last question. Right, thank you. I would just love to sort of applaud the fact that you see education as being um, totally people-centered and not, in fact, system-centered, which happens in so many other countries. And also, I think the blueprint that you have actually highlighted in the sense of developing a child's own potential through the five lessons, the five finished lessons, is something I'm sure Latvia will take on board. My question to you is, is, is actually what role does the local community play and the parents play in developing, uh, let's say, the curriculum of a localized school? Yeah, yeah. Extremely important thing. And, and when I talk about customization, I actually talk about localization as well. And um, I think part of the, this Finnish success story is this customization of the school through the, the, the local communities, where the communities has, have been part, now during the last 20 years already, part of the curriculum design on each, each and every school. I think those times are gone probably here as well where we can believe that the ministry or central agency can decide here in Riga what is best for the uh, children in the small villages or smaller towns uh, around Latvia. So, but again, this is something that we cannot turn around like this overnight. We have to have a plan how we engage communities and teachers and students as young people as well to make build this better uh, education system. Let me finish by my own summary of this whole thing. Uh, and, and thanking you very much for your attention and interest and, and wonderful qu questions that you have. You know, the purpose of my being here this morning is to bring you hope. I, and I, see, I can see a lot of hope in your eyes when you, when you think about education, you think about your own schools. Don't give up because there is hope. And I, I think the, the story of Finland is a, is a concrete story that we can make a difference if we just uh, stop trying to do the wrong things right. Yeah? And I think three things that are important here. The one is that we know now, we know now what works. We know how to build a good education system, a, a good school. So it's not a question about that we would know what to do. So we know exactly how to make this if you just want to do this. We have the resources as well. Your country has the resources. You don't have too much of the resources, but you have enough resources in your people and also in your, in your budgets to make the difference, to make this happen. And thirdly, and this is common to all of us, is that we have a, a kind of an urgency to do this. Yeah? Nobody in this room or very few people in Finland think that we don't need to do anything. I think most people think that we have to do something urgently. There's a need to transform and change education as we know it now. And with this, all these three things, I think we are much better positioned than if we didn't have agreement on these three things. So with these words, I personally I thank, thank you all very much for having me here and I thank the, all the organizers for putting together this wonderful thing. And finally, I hope that I can continue to work with your great teachers and great schools uh, and your great country. Thank you so much.